think you're going to go out there and get six to 12 bites a day at the max on a great day, usually. But those fish are going to be better average fish than the fish that you're catching a drop shot or a crankbait or a chatterbait normally day in and day out. So make sure preparing yourself to not get a lot of bites, not getting frustrated with it. I will tell you, I've fished tournaments where I've gone out saying, I'm only going to fish a frog. And knowing that, I have, might not get a bite until one o'clock in the afternoon, just because the conditions aren't right yet and the fish don't want to eat it. But I don't want to pick up something else and get sidetracked. Because that time of when they're really going to start to bite from one to three o'clock, I could pick up what I call the bonus fish in between. And that one to three o'clock could be those five or six bites. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out and got five bites in a day, but I've weighed 25, 26 pounds, you know, in a tournament. And that's only because I fished a frog all day long versus I could have picked up a Senko and caught a hundred fish that day. But once again, I still probably only would have weighed 12 or 13 pounds. So to me, having the mental preparation of knowing I'm going out there and throwing a frog, easiest way to do that when you're going out there fishing, only take your frog rod, only take your frog box. Don't take nothing else so that you're pretty much locked into throwing a frog. But understand the conditions better be right for that. I talk about the hook set. Equipment is another huge part of, of, of having that. Having the right rod, the right reel, the right line, and of course having the right frog is huge. For me, when it comes to a frog, I designed a frog called the Fat Mat Daddy Frog. Actually, first I designed the Fat Frog for uh, Snag Proof, and then uh, two years ago I got the opportunity to revamp my frog, which, you know, you make a bait, things happen, you want to make something, you want to change something and get a little bit better. But when I designed the Fat Frog, the best hook on the market was the Gamagatsu EWG hook, the frog hook that's in there that most of you guys have seen. I mean, who's thrown a spro, spro frog? Pretty much most of the guys in here. Well, that's the hook that I initially used in the design of that snag proof. Well, I was fishing a tournament on the California Delta, and in practice, I rolled up to this dock, I skip my frog up underneath this dock, and I start walking it, and I pause it, and all of a sudden, I see this weight coming. And I mean, it looked like a seal coming at this thing. So I'm winding the frog back in its practice. And all of a sudden, this fish, that I'm telling you, it's that long and that wide, comes up, and follows it right to the boat, and then swims back underneath the dock. Well, obviously, where I'm going to start the first day of the tournament. <laughs> so at this point in time, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm dialed. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I know what I need to do. Pull up there first day of the tournament, get lined up on the dock, and once again, first spot I'm through, first cast I'm going to make. Everybody gets that, want to get that first cast over to the left or over the right? No, I'm going straight for the gully on the first cast. Skip it up underneath that dock, twitch, it just goes and eats it how it's supposed to. And when they eat it like that, I don't want this giant, huge splash. I just want them to just kind of suck it under. And that means that at that point in time, they've got it way down in the throat. So I do my hook set like this. Always set the hook. I'm talking 1 o'clock position, 12 o'clock position, 11 o'clock position. None of this 9 o'clock. None of this side three o'clock position. You don't want to do that. You will roll the frog out of that fish's mouth. You don't want to wind to the side. You want to set up and just keep cranking, always keeping that rod up. But when I designed the frog, I wanted to keep the hooks on the top of the roof of the mouth. So if you set upwards, you're trying to put those two hooks through the roof of his head. You do that, you're not going to lose them. So this fish eats it. Winding, 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 winding. Fish comes up, opens his mouth. Got her, frog comes flying back. <laughs> Reel up the frog. Hooks are bent back out on it. At that point in time, I knew I needed to make a revision to the hook of the frog. So the new frog that I designed has a lot beefier hook in it. And that's why I fish. Minimum 50 pound braided line. Usually go to 65 most of the time when I'm fishing slop and fishing mess. The frog rod that I use is a seven foot, four inch Daiwa Tatula Elite Series frog rod. It's the same rod that I've been using for the last 10 years. I just put, finally got to put my name on it because I initially designed it. A seven three to one gear ratio reel. You don't want an eight to one. You definitely don't want a nine to one. And for surely you don't want a 10 to one reel. 
When you start getting into these higher gear ratios, you gotta remember, you set the hook, you might have a three or four pound bass, but you're gonna have 10 to 15 pounds of grass on it, and so you're trying to turn that handle. Lower gear ratios allow you to turn that handle. But if you get too low in the gear ratio, you start getting into the four of the ones or the five of the ones, you're not gonna be able to keep up with that fish. So when you when you go to set the hook, you got all that slack out there, having that lower gear ratio, you're not able to turn the handle. For me, seven three to one is the best gear ratio. You're talking 36 to 38 inches of line, uh, depending on the reel size that you're using, which is very, very important. Six three to one minimum gear ratio when you're fishing a frog. If you start getting into the five to ones, you start getting higher than that, I'm telling you, you're definitely gonna have issues. Braided line. Always braided line. No fluorocarbon leader, no monofilament leader. It doesn't matter. All the topwater baits that I go out there and I throw, I always throw on braid, regardless of whichever one it is. The only adjustment I make is I'll do an 18 inch shock monofilament leader that's usually 20 to 25 pound test on a devil's horse. And that's only because the little props on there, when you start working a devil's horse, it will actually inhale the braid into it. So that's the only time. But any other time, straight braid to the frog, straight braid to the buzz bait, straight braid to the walking bait. Your spooks, your pop bars, all top waters. Reason is, braid floats on the top. Monofilament has a slow sink to it. Fluorocarbon has a fast sink to it. You don't want the bait's nose coming down when you're trying to fish top water. Equipment's very, very important when you're out there fishing, having the right equipment. You don't want to go out there and try to drop shot with a flipping stick because you're not going to feel the bites or not going to work the equipment right. You're not going to throw a, a jig on a spinnerbait rod because you're never going to get the hooks in. You're not going to get the feel. You've got to pay attention to your equipment, and that's so hugely important. That's the biggest mistakes that I see that the majority of the anglers out there do is not having the right equipment for the particular bait that they're using, especially when you're frog fishing, especially when you're flipping, especially when you're swim bait fishing, pretty much especially when you're fishing any technique. I mean, it's like you watch these guys like Brent Ayler and Brett Height who throw chatterbaits. Because I mean, how many guys throw chatterbait in here? Everybody. <coughs> how many guys throw a chatterbait on a fiberglass or a composite rod? One guy, two guys, three, four guys. I'm gonna tell you how important throwing a chatterbait on a composite rod is, or a fiberglass rod is. You always watch those guys, when they're out there fishing that chatterbait, they're winding it back. You never see them guys set the hook. You never see them guys swing hard. What they do is they turn the handle of that reel, and then they lean into that fish to bury that hook into the fish. Think about a chatterbait. Chatterbait has a metal lip on the front of it. If you go and you slack line set, that metal lip is gonna hit that fish in the back of his mouth and he's, all he's gonna do is do this. And that chatterbait's gone. But if you ever watch those guys with that composite rod, it allows that fish to grab onto that bait. That metal lip slips through his mouth because you're just winding harder. He's trying to clamp down even harder on it now because it's trying to get away from him. And all you do is you bury that hook in the roof of his head or in the side of his jaw, whichever way the chatterbait is turned. And so fishing the composite rod on the chatterbait is super hugely important because it allows you to land these fish. I mean, I know you guys have all been out there, you're throwing your chatterbait out there, and all of a sudden the thing dang near slack lines you, and you go like this, and you're like, oh my god, how did I miss that thing? Or you go, you set the hook, and you're just like, oh my god, I got him, and he comes up and shakes his head and hops off. A lot of times what they're doing is on reaction baits, they're, the bait's coming along this way. They come up, they're inhaling the bait. And that's why you see guys like Rick Klun and Kevin Van Dam use fiberglass and composite rods for cranking. It's allowing that fish to inhale that bait before you feel them. Graphite rods are a lot more sensitive than fiberglass is or composite is. And the taper of the rod is a lot faster action on graphite. They want that slower taper to allow that fish to inhale that fish. Same thing goes with fighting the fish and landing the fish, which is very important. When I'm talking about frog fishing, I see a lot of guys do this. Set the hook and they're like, I got him, I got him. And then they stop reeling and they, 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 they try to play the fish. And all of a sudden they lose the fish. I can't tell you how many times I've been out there fishing and I'm throwing a frog. One comes up, eats it. I go, got it. Reel, 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 reel. Swing him the boat. What happens? Fish is laying there on his side and he goes, spits the frog out. 
never stop reeling. It's how you fight the fish is why you lose them. That fish was never ever hooked, but because my action was holding it in his mouth and I'm whining, I flip him in the boat, he comes off. You gotta remember, we're in their element. And so when a bait goes by, they eat it, we've gotta do everything it takes. And equipment is so huge and important when it comes to it. And that's with any particular bait, making sure you have the right equipment. I mean, you don't go out there and you wanna go drop shot fishing and you start going out there and drop shotting with 10 or 12 pound test line, fishing for smallmouth in gin crystal clear water. You wanna, if you're gonna do that, yeah, you can use 10 or 12 pound test braid because it has a diameter of two to three pound test fluorocarbon. And then you're using a shock leader to it that's usually five or six pound test line. Any questions so far? Dang, I'm a great seller. Oh. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm a great seller <laughs> speaker. Go for it. It's going to help sell something. Uh, you help sell something? Yeah. Okay, what do you sell? Frog is my favorite frog. I don't know what you call it, but I know you're new with the bat. Bat Daddy Frog, yes. Yes. Yes, we are working on a new version. Basically, right now, when I initially made the bat frog, I actually put a tube in it that kept the water out of the body. I've changed the plastic a little bit because I wanted to make my frog a little bit heavier, but putting that tube in it, it wants to be too heavy and it wants to sink. So now I'm still trying to revise it. As of right now, the Fat Mat Daddy Frog by River to Sea is great, but it's not perfect. And I'm trying to get it perfect, but perfection is hard to get in any kind of bait. I mean, there's no perfect bait out there, but I like perfection. The one thing about River to Sea for me is when I signed up with them, when we're talking eight years ago, <coughs> the first thing that the owner told me is he goes, I want you to have 100% design control on the base that you use. And so now we're getting to that point where all the River to Sea baits are designed by the pros. Because the owner will tell you, he's not a fisherman, he's a businessman. So he's like, you guys design, I will help you guys make, the engineer will make them the way you want them, and then we put the baits out there. You know, the Whopper Plopper, which, how many guys have thrown a Whopper Plopper? Everybody's thrown a Whopper Plopper, dang bait. But Larry Dahlberg, the guy could buy a small island now for as many Whopper Ploppers that have been sold, wouldn't buy me a drink. I would buy the cheapest guy in the whole wide world. We're at, I gotta tell you this. So, we're at ICAS, uh, this is two years ago, in the heat of Whopper Plopper. I fortunately accidentally got sent his uh, royalty check one month. The Brinks truck showed up and was <laughs> unloading his royalty check. And I was just like, dang, that's pretty awesome. And I look at it, and I'm like, God, I had a great month. And, or a great quarter. And they're just like, I'm like, oh, it's got Larry Dahlberg's name on it. And i like, oh, yeah, I got Larry Dahlberg's uh, royalty check for this last quarter. They go, no, that's his one-month royalty check. <laughs> So I'm like, cool, we're going to ICAST. We get to ICAST and stuff. I see Larry, hey man, how's it going? He goes, Ish, how's it going? He goes, man, you need to come up and fish for some of these musky, man, up here and stuff. He goes, I know you like to catch big fish. I'm like, yeah. And so I order a drink and I order a mojito and stuff. And I'm like, Larry, you want anything and stuff? And he's like, oh, I'll just have a beer and stuff like this. And so at this point in time, I'm like, okay, Larry's had a great year on the Whopper Plopper. Larry, you gonna grab the check? Like. It's a mojito and a beer. Um, he, oh, yeah, yeah, I got, I got, I, I got, yeah, just the beer, please. <laughs> I'm like, Larry, are you really not going to buy my drink? Like, really? I was like, at that point in time, we were no longer friends. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the Walk Flopper, it's amazing. It's, it's funny, but I had to tell you guys that because I, I still get burned up by the, like, the dude's royalty check was bigger in one month than my quarterly check for four different baits and he's not trying to buy me a drink. And I sold it for him. But yeah, no, the, the, the right now, I mean, I'm still trying to make it even better. But the first thing for me when I changed from the Fat Frog to the Fat Mat Daddy Frog, the first initial was the hook. And then secondly, I needed something that was a little bit heavier that you don't have to kind of <laughs> add weights to to get that impression into the mat. 
because for some reason it seems like I'm starting to fish a lot more places with a lot thicker grass, like a lot of the stuff that you see out there on the upper bay and uh, a lot of duckweed that you get back in there. Plus, it being heavier, I could actually skip it further back up underneath trees and things like that. So now I've got a hook and a heavier bait that's a little bit wider that gives a lot of more impression <coughs> in the water. And it, for me, I can actually walk it easier. Um, some of the uh, other frogs out there have a big, huge keel on them that allow them to walk, but they don't make great frogs for fishing on mats. And that's why I put a flat bottom on mine because it makes it good for fishing mats and walking. And that's hugely key when fishing it. Plus, once again, uh, I never won a tournament, a uh, bass match tournament solely on the fat frog, but I did win one this year on my fat mat daddy frog. And so I just, that says a lot to me. Any other questions? Another frog that hooks way right on top of the body. Correct. Thing. I was watching the show the other day, and I used, did it already, where they bend the hooks up to get it off the body. Yeah. Why don't they just make them that way? Uh, the question is, is that uh, the question is, is uh, most of the frogs that you see out there, and it's not all of them, but the hooks actually lay on top of the frog like so. And he's talking about why don't they make them where they're actually bend up? And and so the reason that they don't do that is, is if you fish a frog in a mat, you really don't want to bend those hooks up because sometimes that frog will land on its top side, and if the hooks are bent up, it's just going to hook into the mat. And you're going to drag that mat and you pretty much ruin the spot so the fish the, the whole frog actually squeezes down anyways but yes i've seen it in open water and i've done it myself to where fish you actually open up the hooks just a little bit and fishing it in open water but a frog to me is pretty much designed to fish in super heavy cover i do catch some open water frog fish with it but at that time if i'm in open water i would actually rather throw a spook because the hookup ratio is that much better so that's why they don't put the hooks actually bent up you know, it's kind of one of those things that you can tweak them a little bit. People ask me about, you know, altering a frog. Um, I very rarely alter my frogs. I trim the legs a little bit. If the fish are short striking or I'm fishing on top of a mat, I, I, I actually like the legs long when it, they're on top of the mat because it gives them more stuff to grab onto. But if they're short striking, yes, I will trim the legs a little bit more to just spread them out. And especially when I'm, if I'm walking in, in open water and I stop it, those legs will spread out a lot better when you cut them a little bit shorter. It just gives a bigger profile. But those are really the only alterations I do. Lift the hooks up when I'm fishing in open water a little bit at times, but the majority of the times I don't because the frog will actually collapse a lot better. Hey, what about on your under frogs, those little stingers? Stinger hooks, they make them slide over the two hooks. And stick up they give you a little extra in case they hit they hit short there's you saw yeah. the, the question is about stinger hooks i never use a stinger hook on a frog reason is if you're going to walk on a bed of needles the more needles that are out there the easier it is to walk on that bed you're talking about trying to hook two hooks into a fish's mouth now you're trying to add a third hook to the fish's mouth and if something gets whether that stinger hooks grabs onto a piece of wood or it hangs on the grass, it's keeping you from trying to penetrate those hooks in that fish's mouth. So technically, I would love to have a single hook in a frog, and I've experimented with that. Two is about the best because of the advancement of the equipment that we have now with braided line and the actual rod materials that we're able to use allows you to get a good hook up ratio. One would be the perfect setup to do that. Two is good. Three is not going to be good because you're still trying to penetrate an extra hook and even four could be worse so i never use trailer hooks on the back of my frog um guys that are using trailer hooks that feel like they have two on a frog they're not using the right equipment the right equipment is so hugely key to landing fish on a frog and it's how you bite the fish once again set the hook in that upward motion turn the handle don't stop turning the handle your buddy's not there with the net you put the fish in his lap and if he gets mad at you for putting the fish in his lap, tell him next time he needs to be faster with the net. <laughs> but if you sit there and you fight, you wait for that net, and you want to fight him, you're going to lose that fish. What about um, frog fur? Right now, you know, they, they're coming out with products that are kind of like a Velcro, like you were mentioning, if the fish doesn't actually have the hooks. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's kind of something that you're going to start to see with more baits in the future? The question is about Velcro. 
uh, on frogs. You're starting to see it, and they're implementing a lot of new materials in the frogs. I think that's the worst idea ever is Velcro. <laughs> Once again, it's something that's going to hold the fish, but it's not helping you to penetrate. The more things that you have to try to help penetrate those hooks or keep you from penetrating those hooks into the fish, the more fish you're going to lose. It's great for a guy who wants to sit there and let the fish eat the frog and he wants to fall asleep and let him swim around with it. It's great for practice. I think it would be awesome to use Velcro for practice because you want to see the fish he can come up and he can jump and it will pop out of his mouth. But you're talking about, once again, Velcro that's going to grab his teeth and hold his, the frog from moving. You've got to move that frog. I get on my dad all the time about frog fishing is, is I, we go out we go fishing and, and my dad he's infamous for my dad knows everything in the world but still calls me and asks me one million questions when we're out fishing and i watch him we're frog fishing i watch one eat his frog and he just kind of goes like that crack the beak and he <laughs> fish his head cross his eyes he goes why he goes i got him he jumps and he comes up all oh, that one came up dad watch Ooh. <laughs> Got him. In the boat. Easy. A, he eats it. B, you whine. C, he's in the boat. That easy, Dad. But, but yeah, but one of the other stories I'll tell you about, like I had told the story yesterday about having the right equipment is, so I'm fishing this Costa, and this is probably 2011, 12, somewhere around there, somewhere in there, and I'm leading the Costa. I've got an eight pound lead going into the final day. I get drawn with the guy, the co-angler, who's uh, actually in first place. He's in first place too, so it's the two first place guys going out the last day in the coast. Of. Well, we go up to the meeting, we're talking and stuff like this, and I'm like, man, how'd it get a week and stuff like this? He goes, yeah, I've been catching them all on a drop shot. <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've had, I got my drop shots and stuff set up. I said, you might as well leave them things at home. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, you will be nowhere near any drop shot water or anything close to drop shotting. If you want to drop shot on top of the mat, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> and he's like, okay. He goes, well, what do I need? I said, first, you need a punch rod with 65 pound braid and somewhere between a seven and a half and an eight foot punch rod ready to go. He goes, all right, I got a flipping stick. I can, I can handle that. And I said, secondly, you need a frog rod. And those are the only two rods you need. He goes, oh, okay, I got that. So the next day he shows up and I'm like, all right, I'm thinking this guy is gonna be somewhat dialed here. He shows up with a spinning rod with 30 pound braid on it and his frog tied up. And I'm just like, dude, I got extra frog rods. I mean, I live with frog rods. I was born with frog rod in my hand. I'll let you borrow one. And he's like, no, 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 I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I get more accuracy with it and stuff like this. And I'm just like, dude, trust me. You're not, you don't have the right equipment. You're not ready for this. He goes, oh, I land frog fish all the time. And I'm like, so you catch a lot of frog fish? Yeah, I've caught about 20 or 30 over the course, you know? I'm like, this week? He goes, no, like in my lifetime. And I'm like, dude, I've caught thousands. And I'm like, all right, you know, once again, can't tell a grown man anything. He knows everything the way he wants. And so I let him, we get out there and I catch a couple, I got a three pounder, I got a four pounder in a boat. Got this stretch of mat. It's about, you go 50 yards this way, 50 yards this way. It's just solid chalk mat. And there's this one beautiful five to six foot hole in it. Like, it's like God cut the hole out of itself out of this mat and pulled it up there. And the fish at this time, they're somewhat getting on beds a little bit. It's a pre-spawn bite going on. So I throw my frog over there and I walk my frog and I'm creating freaking tic-tac-toe lines in the frog mat. I'm like, he's gonna eat it. One's gonna eat right now, never eats it. 20 casts, I'm telling you at least 20 casts to this hole, nothing. This guy takes his first cast, a frog. And he throws it, and it, I, I just watch this thing. It's, it, it's like a rainbow Steph Curry shot. And this guy comes down and goes, Smack, right dab in the hole, right? Doesn't move it. Oh, eats it. Like, oh my God. And I just watch him. Got him. <laughs> Once again, ugly stick commercial. Who has seen the ugly stick commercial where the rod gets bent to the butt? That's exactly what was going on there. I watched this thing. 
and it's just bent. It's done. And he's just like, he's got this look on his face. He's like, I got him. He's like closing his eyes. And he's trying to reel a handle. And I'm just like, you ain't got him. You don't have him. And all of a sudden, you see this thing just go, frog comes flying back. The guy's in tears in the middle of the boat. Like, he's just like, oh, my God, I, I just lost a tournament. And I'm like, dude, I told you, you don't have the right. He goes, man, I've caught so many frogfish and stuff like that. I said, dude, you've caught like 20 or 30 frogfish ever. Once again, I, nice guy that I am, I'm leading the tournament. Dude, I got another frog rod right in the bottom. Matter of fact, you can have the one on my deck, and I'll grab another one. I've got a spare. Don't worry. No, no, man, I, I'm, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. Fine. I go down the bag. I catch four pounder, catch another one about six. I'm like, all right, I'm having a good time going down the stretch. About an hour and a half later or so, same thing. Pretty mat going this way giant hole in this mat, get down there through it, and just like, I'm catching this sucker, I know we want in there. Work my draw, spin it around, make it moonwalk backwards, still the fish won't eat it. Still won't eat it. And then I see it again. Choo! <laughs> <laughs> And I just smile. <laughs> I've got him this time. I guarantee you, I got him this time. Did you hear that drag? <laughs> like a broken Volkswagen just screaming. You gotta go in there and get him. You gotta go in there and get him. And I'm just sitting here, just like I'm gonna tear up this beautiful mat to go in there for a fish that he doesn't have. And in my head, I know he doesn't have. But me being the nice guy, kick the troll motor on high. Cut through the mat, just four wheel drive. <laughs> right there to it. Jump down, you gotta help me, you gotta help me. I grab the grass, I grab the frog, set the frog on the deck. I stand back up on the trolling motor, take trolling on a high, go out of the mat, don't say a word to the guy, keep on fishing. And all of myself is, I'm not offering the rod again. I told him he had his chance. Wrong equipment, guy. One, either one of those fish would have won him a brand new Ranger boat. Because he did not have the right equipment, cost him a brand new Ranger boat. I'm not that stubborn. Once again, I pay attention to the guys who are the best at what they do. I'm the same guy. My equipment, Brent Height, best chatterbait fisherman out there. Brent Ayler was his roommate. The rod that Brent Height had was an Ebola Japanese rod. Brent Ayler designed a Daiwa rod exactly from that same rod. Same reel, same 20 pound fluorocarbon, exact same equipment that I fish. Skate Reese, Rick Klon, best crankers in the world, composite rods. I use the exact same rods that, that they use. Greg Hackney, one of the best jig fishermen out there. Seven foot one inch jig rod, heavy action, exact same rod. That's how I fish it. The guys who are the best at it, obviously the best at it for a reason, who have designed the equipment. And so those are the things you have to pay attention to, which will definitely improve a lot of your fishing. Did I answer your question? Yeah, perfect. How about uh, not, what not use the tie frog? What not did I use the tie frog? It's called a double polymer. So oh. basically you take the loop and you go through the eye, you take that loop and go back through the eye a second time, one single overhand knot, wet it, slip the loop, the bait through the loop. Now here's the key to it. You don't pull both tag ends when you go to cinch it. You either pull the one leading to the rod or you pull the one tag end that you're going to cut off. Only one, not both of them. You pull one till it's completely tight, then you pull the second one. Because if you pull them all at, both at the same time, it'll pre cinch the knot where you'll have the loop still not completely closed and the knot's not solid. Any other questions? So, from your experience in prop fishing, what's the ideal condition? What's the ideal condition for throwing a frog and what's the worst condition for throwing a frog? The ideal condition for throwing a frog is depending on the, the lake that you're on. So give me, give me a lake that you fish regularly that I might know. And I fish a lot of lakes. Champlain. Champlain? Champlain. Okay. Champlain. Missicoy or Ticonderoga? Ticonderoga. Okay, get down to Ticonderoga. I'm gonna have two frogs set up when I go down there. A black one, I'm gonna have a white one. 
black one's going to be for the dirty water that you get down there where the water's running through and the water's actually dirty in that grass and if you look underneath the map that water's dirty cloudy day you're going to use a black frog first thing in the morning late in the afternoon you're going to use a black frog now you have the white one when you get in that gin crystal clear water where the water gets filtered through that grass and it's real clean and you see the bass swimming through there then you're going to use that one in the middle of the day ideal conditions down there is pretty much um water the weather's been stable we're talking high 70s low 80s super stable weather the last couple of days moon phase does not matter water temperature degrees anything above 65 degrees and it's going to be game on worst conditions on any lake is a change in conditions when you're frog fishing that's why it is so hard to win a multiple day tournament on a frog because conditions never stay the same four days in a row if you see it with dean rojas's one he's throwing a frog but he's had to flip to win those tournaments too because conditions have changed mississippi river for me i got fortunate we had the same conditions other than the water rising it made it better but usually changing conditions make frog fishing works. A little ripple could happen, a breeze could happen, you could go from overcast to sunny skies, that will change the frog bite. So I don't want any changing conditions. Stable conditions are the best conditions for throwing frog. What do you feel about popping frogs? What do I feel about popping frogs? They're great for in those changing conditions. When the wind picks up, a popping frog is great. That's why I, when I made the snag proof one I made, it's called the popping fatty and it, it, it acts as a popper that sprays water and i'm working on a version a popping version of the fat frog as well i just once again i don't like making baits exactly the same and i don't like making baits that are look, look the same or they have the same action i want to change actions of baits to try to find that right one when you look at the popping fatty it actually has a double mouth on it which no other frog has the first cast i made with that bait i caught a four pounder on it when I had the sample and I knew it was right from there. So I'm looking to try to redesign a new version of a popping frog. But yeah, popping frogs are great. I mean, and you fish them on the same exact equipment. You mentioned the black and the white frog. Is there ever a reason we have to carry more than two colors? Yes. So here's the deal. Three colors, and, uh, and I'll give you the basics of uh, the frogs for me. There's, and it doesn't have to be black or white. It is dark colors on dark cloudy days first thing in the morning late in the afternoon low light conditions light color frogs whites white and chartreuses and uh bright sunny days clear water middle of the day and then i mix in a bluegill pattern frog when the bass are on the bluegill and that's pretty much it so keeping three colors of frogs basically is, is all you really need you could buy every color out there because to some people it's confidence, but once again, when you're fishing on top of a mat, they don't see that color. They, don't, they can even tell you what color it is. You got a cheese mat and you're throwing a frog on top of a mat, it could be white, blue, purple, green, yellow. They can't tell what color it is. All they see is that there's something making an impression on top of the water. I used to have buddies who tell me all the time, oh man, they're only eating the black frog, they're only eating the white frog. Would you try the other color? Well, no. <laughs> so now you know they're not eating any other color. So it's pretty simple. I mean, but those three colors you stick with a light frog, a dark frog, and a bluegill pattern, you're going to cover all your bases. I've actually got a new color coming out, and it's actually a no color. It's uh, clear. And the reason I like that one is if you can paint it, do whatever you want to it, and you change the color. Once again, some people just have confidence. I'll tell you this is. They're coming. There are no real special colors that these guys have. I mean, you see it, Kevin Mandan, Skeet Reese, myself, we don't make special colors. It's the same stuff that you see in the packages out there. I, I mean, oh, well, it has to have this stripe on it or this line to it to, to be, if you get something close, the fish are going to eat it. It's not that complicated. I think we make this thing too complex. I've simplified my system when it comes to fishing. I've taken the majority of my tackle out of my boat. 
How many times have you gone out there and you've tried all these different things and you go back to that same spinner bait you always caught them on? The same crankbait you always caught them on, the same jerk bait, the same top water, the same color plastic. I will tell you this is when it comes to Cinco's, which is my one of my least favorite baits to throw, I carry four colors in my boat. I carry a green pumpkin, I carry a black one, I carry a watermelon red one, and I carry a June bug one. The June bug one, is the only place I ever throw that thing is when I'm in Florida. The black one, the only place I ever throw that one is in dirty water, and when I come up here to fish north in that crystal clear water, green pumpkin and watermelon red are two that are split about 40% of the time each is when I throw those and I catch fish on them. Anything that goes with a lot of my plastic, same thing that goes with jigs. I mean, how many times are you like, oh man, I've had this jig, I spent three hours tying up this special color jig, and your buddy's back there catching them on a black and blue one he bought out of the package. We try to make these things somewhat too complicated. It's, it's, it's not that. And, and then the biggest thing is having fun while you're out there fishing. I mean, I think that's a lot that uh, a lot of people have forgotten. And I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you having a bad attitude going into a tournament, that's the worst thing that you don't want to do. I don't care if Mike Iaconelli, Ski Reese, and Kevin Van Dam show up to your club tournament, you better be out there like, yeah, I'm about to kick these boys' butts. <laughs> Not be like, oh, man, they're here. It's so funny. I, I show up, like, I fished a coast event this last um, spring or fall in September, and I got like a half a day of practice, and I showed up there, and guys were just like, oh, fish is here. And I'm like, yeah, I only got a half a day of practice. I'm going to win this thing shut these guys down like they're emotionally broken at that point like what do you mean you had a half a day of practice the first day i go out and i'm in the top 10 i'm like yeah i did that on a half a day of practice and then i'm like you guys lucky i didn't practice then what and it, but it shuts them down they have a bad attitude about it and, and that and that's just me playing mind games to being in that competition i mean i used to do it in the club tournaments and stuff how many times have you guys gone out there and you've heard oh man they're not biting today uh, prime example is this freaking FLW that's going on right now. Them guys are all the stuff that was on social media and all through the websites was, oh, fish is tough at Rayburn. It sucks. Okay, 28 pound bag, 29 pound bag, 25, 25, 25. There was like 20, 20 pound bags caught the first day. Does that sound like tough fishing to you guys? Fishermen are liars. <laughs> so don't believe anything that they say. Except you. No, from the standpoint of, no, 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 don't believe, don't believe me if we're in a tournament, trust me, because they could be jumping on a frog everywhere, and I'll be like, dude, frog bites me, completely off, like, don't even, you don't even want to throw the frog, dude, go up there, drop shot, hey, drop shot, you'll catch 100 a day, you probably weigh like 35 pounds on the drop shot, guaranteed, or you have your fish in tournament against them, yeah. or you're catching them on a spinner wheel. Very good. And I'm catching on a spinning reel, yeah. Actually, I'm throwing a frog on a spinning reel. That's how they're, they're only eating a frog throwing it on a spinning reel. That's the only way you're going to catch them today, man. I'm telling you, trust me. Okay. You come up, let's say you lose a fish on a frog. Okay. Okay. It takes one jump and he spits it back down at you. Okay. Okay. Do you have a particular follow up bait or do you just throw the frog back in there, you move on and come back later? Okay. I don't throw a follow-up bait, and I'm going to tell you this for, own, for multiple reasons, and I will do it in one condition if I throw a frog out there and the fish is not trying to eat the bait. That means that he's in a guarding mode for the fact that he's not interested in that frog. When a bass is interested in a frog, he's interested in a frog. It's kind of like you. You're sitting there, and you want steak been promised steak, your wife says, honey, we're barbecuing steaks, and she's told you this for the last two days, and you're like, today's the day, we're having steaks and stuff, and you get home, and she's got chicken laid out there. <laughs> well, I really don't want chicken. When a, fat, a fish is trying to eat a bait, he wants that bait. If he's not interested in the bait, he's trying to slap at it, then he's in a guarding mode. And so that's the time that you have to give them exactly what they want. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to follow up fish and not gotten a bite and then threw the frog back there at that fish and he actually ate it and got it. The first time, if he usually he misses it, I'm going to throw it back there two, three, four times. And then I might pick up a follow, follow up bait if I don't catch that fish again. 
but it's most of the time it's not. If he's trying to get that frog, he's gonna eat the frog again. And I just, but that's my confidence in a frog. I I have 110 percent confidence in a frog. I will go into a tournament and have two frog rods on the deck, and that's it, and not have anything else, knowing that I'm gonna catch him on a frog. I'll go three hours of fishing and not have a bite on the frog, but knowing that when they're when they're going to eat it, I'm going to catch them. And so that's kind of why I stick with the bait that you know brought me there. So now with this uh, MLF surf, when you uh, go to these new lakes that you've never been to, what are your like four rods that you got to have on the deck? To start Question is, what four rods am I going to have on my rods that I have my, my my search rods that I'm going to have on the deck? It's not about the four rods that I'm gonna have on the deck for search rods. The deal is, is that one, I love the frogfish. Two, I love the punch and I love the flip. So those two rods are on my deck first and foremost, the frog rod and the punch rod. I'm looking for those conditions when I pull up to a lake. We get our 45 minute drive around, I'm driving around looking for those conditions. Now, say I don't find those conditions then I'm looking for a chatterbait or a square bill pipe because those are the conditions that I like to fish. When I show up to Major League Fishing or a lake that I've never been to before, I'm looking for the conditions and the technique that is going to best suit me. It's not always the way to win that tournament on some of those places, but it's definitely the way to build the confidence because I know the conditions that I'm looking for. I know exactly what's going to happen. I know the baits that I need to use. I know the colors that I need to use. So. For me, it's starting out frog rod, punch rod, chatterbait, square bill, or spinnerbait, square bill are the rock conditions I'm looking for. And if not, that's when you start alternating and going into drop shotting. <laughs> Cinco. <laughs> Carolina rig. <laughs> and it's funny because I talk bad about Carolina rigs. And I, I mean, I can tell you that. A Carolina rig, I'd rather go to the dentist, mow the lawn, do that business, watch paint dry, pay bills, and then go Carolina rig. But the biggest limb in a bass I ever caught in a Bass Master tournament, which was 35 pounds, 12 ounces, was on a Carolina rig. I literally, for two hours, every single cast caught a two hours, a four to seven pounder on Lake Falcon. Unbelievable! Like you just throw it out there, hits the bottom, and one's on there. That's how good it was, and that's the only time that I ever Carolina rigged. And I threw a jig up there, but I'd go like four casts before I got a bite with the jig, and so I just that was Carolina rig. He was on every cast. You hate Carolina rigs. How, how did you figure? Okay, let me try Carolina rigs. Well, okay. the part was is I pulled up to the spot, and I found the spot deep cranking, and. I'm deep cranking and I'm, I'm working down a bank, down a stretch, and this little point pops out and I catch one. And then I'm fishing there for a little bit and stuff and I'm like, all right, catch another one. And then I'm fishing there for a little bit and I mean, but it's taking some time for this to actually happen, like getting bites. It's like, all right, so then I, I go get on the motor, kind of circle around the spot, look at my graph and see them like cordwood stacked on this point. That's when I'm just like, all right, let's alternate. Next thing I do, throw a big spoon out there, throw the flutter spoon, catch one, finally, after seven, eight, ten casts. Throw a jig up there, four or five casts later. Throw a Carolina rig up there, catch one. 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 I'm no dummy. <laughs> they want the Carolina rig. I'm giving them the Carolina rig. It's the same thing with the drop shot. The one thing that it, I, I will tell you this is that I talk bad about drop shotting. I talk bad about Cinco. I talk bad about Carolina rigs. I talk bad about shaky heads. But I will tell you this if the tournament goes off, I am really good at all of those techniques. I learned with spinning rod. I'm from out west. I have the drop shot. I prefer not to do it, but if time comes to me to do it, I'm gonna do it. Once again, four to seven pounders on a Carolina rig. Yeah, maybe Peyton ain't so bad. You know, mowing the lawn can wait. I mean, we're talking four to seven pounders. So, another question. I thought. 
How tough of a decision was it for you to leave BASS for MLS? How tough a decision was it? It wasn't a tough decision. It was a decision that had to be made because MLF gave me options. So they gave us this huge presentation about you know what the tour was going to look like. And first thing they said to us, 870 hours of national television coverage. To me, 870 hours of national television coverage is more than anybody else has ever had. When they said that they were starting a tour, I was already automatically pretty much done even before that because I'm sitting there and I'm sitting first class on a flight and the flight attendant comes out and she goes, um, the, flight, the, the pilot wants your autograph. And I'm just like, okay. She goes, yeah, you saw your name on the manifest and wants your autograph. And we're talking about a pilot who sees my name on a manifest and is like, oh, I want his autograph. I go into my local grocery store, not wearing any fishing gear at all. Like I've got um, Nike shoes on, I've got board shorts on, I've got a plain t-shirt on, nothing that says fishing on it. Walk you through and this guy comes up to me and he's like, um, I don't mean to bother you, but are you Ish Monroe? And I'm just like, uh, depends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 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 your wife said that your friends, it wasn't me. I, yeah. And, and he's just like, man, I, I want to tell you this is, he goes, we don't fish, me and my wife don't fish, but we have parties like it's the Super Bowl when Major League Fishing comes on. We love it, the excitement of it. And so for that, that those were the things that were happening. And once again, I go back and, and, and I've asked this question a lot in a lot of events. How many guys actually watch me win the Mississippi River on ESPN? Not on the internet, not on YouTube, but actually on ESPN. How many guys saw it? You saw it on ESPN, one guy. Out of all these people out here that are bass fishing fanatics, one person saw it. How many people watch me catch them on a freaking chatterbait on MLF? Everybody that watches MLF. So those were the decisions that were already made for us when they said that they were going to start this program. And then they got into the fun stuff. And then they started talking about, hey, well, we're going to have two championships. And hey, there's 14 events. And hey, how about this? No entry fee, guys. What do you think about that? No entry fee. Are we? Are we? Fishing? Are we? Are we? Wait. Are we fishing for anything? Oh yeah. Here's the here's the payout, and we're looking at it going. Wait. Hundred plus thousand. Oh, that's sixty seven seventy thousand, right? Oh, championship. What? How much? Where's this money coming from? And it was just like we're fishing for more money now with a zero entry fee, more television time, more sponsor exposure. Right now, Major League Fishing has over 50 sponsors and more signing up every day, and they're biting at the bits. They're calling Major League Fishing going, hey, guys, hey, hey, how, how do we become a part of it? We have towns and cities that are calling saying, hey, we want to have a venue. We need a venue. What does it take for you guys to come out there? Bass, they, they lost a little bit of that, you know? I, I still respect bass. I'm still fishing the bass open just because I'm a fishing junkie. And when I say fishing junkie, I will fish your guys' club tournament this weekend if it was 10 degrees warm. <laughs> <laughs> maybe 15 degrees for maybe friends. Yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but I mean, that, and, and that's just it. I still show up to freaking Wednesday nighters at home. They hate it, but I, I've been asked not to show up anymore. But I'm like, guys, I haven't been to Delta all year long. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll let you fish. Then I go and I win, and they're just like, yeah, you can't come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I'm just a fish junkie. So, yeah, I'm still fishing bass opens. I will still fish coastal events at home for FLW. I would love the fact if the tours wouldn't compete. I would fish both tours. But with X amount of, you know, weekends out there, there's some conflicts and organizations kind of being, what I say, stingy about moving events and not letting us cherry pick. I'm, I'm, I'm going the way that I have to go. You know, Major League Fishing, to me, what I see is their future is for the sport of bass fishing. For all these young guys that are out there, what no entry fee means is you don't have to be rich to go out there and be a bass pro anymore. You know, I was fortunate to be at that age. I'm 44 years old. When I started to go out there, 
you could still buy a bass boat for $25,000 and have the top of the line bass boat with the top of the line electronics for 25 grand. Now you're talking about 100 grand for the top of the line bass boat. So before the no entry fee, you had to look at it this way. Guy goes out, he buys an average bass boat, he's spending seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000. Then he's gotta go out there and buy a fifty or $60,000 truck. Then he's gotta throw another $50,000 in entry fees on top of that. Then he's still gotta pay his bills and his expenses for being on the road. You're talking about a guy who has to have over $200,000 to go out there and try to pursue his career and, and be a bass pro. And that's hard to do. Now with the no entry fee and the exposure that is out there, for these kids is, is, hey, they get to go out, work their way up through the ranks, and earn a spot into a tour that has no entry fee and allows them to make six figures. Who doesn't want to make six figures bass fishing? I want to make seven figures. <laughs> but I mean, but that's how it is. So are you cutting me off? <laughs> I'm a little behind here. Um, he's behind and I get penalized. <laughs> So I guess I'll still be inside if you guys got any more questions and we can talk about more fishing, uh, rods, reels, line. I mean, you guys can ask me anything you want. I'm going to show you the products that I use, but at the same time, I will, you know, tell you about the products that I've seen out there and stuff that I've tested. Thank you. So, uh, one question about Major League, but I just wanted to throw this in there is, so it's about catching numbers of fish and little fish, and I think you're a big bass hammer, so how are you going to do here, man? Well, here's the deal. If I go out and catch five for 30 pounds, he's got to go out and catch 30 for, for 30 pounds. Is that going to happen? Make, oh, it's going to happen. Make it happen? Is he going to get to change the way you fish now? No, you don't have to change the way you fish. Yeah. If you look at Major League Fishing, the guys who actually break out spinning rods in tournaments other than smallmouth tournaments, those guys get their butt kicked. Shaky head does not get you to the next round. It's freaking Kevin Van Dam, that stupid jerk bait. That's going to be interesting. Everybody has it on their mind, so I bet you get bombarded with that question. Yeah, that's one I've that's asked around many, many, many times. But uh, it's changing the sports, changes, you know, change is bad. You know, nobody likes change, but I was here. <laughs> so anyway, make sure you leave. We're going to grab a ticket from uh, Mr. Hollis out there. We're going to get some more door prizes. Greg and Tom are up next. Drop shot of Seth Nichols. Hey, that's all right. Thank you. 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 Thank